thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to uh, speak here. And uh, so I will, uh, at the beginning, I will try to focus uh, mainly on uh, the roots of uh, Czech uh, cautiousness towards uh, European Union and <coughs> Euro. And plus, I saw also at the end, I would like to take a, since I consider myself being among few Czech uh, Euro federalists who are like uh, frequently proposing some vision of European uh, Federation, I would like to speak a little bit uh, about it uh, for five minutes. Uh, also, I have, uh, uh, I'm mostly writing on political economy recently and the uh, crisis of the Euro. So in the discussions, in, but even though it is very complicated, and it's a full-time job these days to understand all these new institutions and their role as it's uh, being discussed uh, on the European level. I am also trying to have an opinion on this, but I, in the discussion you can ask me about anything on EFSF or ESM or whatever, uh, even though in, in the presentation I'm not going to be that technical or I will not touch it. So back uh, uh, first I would like to... Uh, ask if uh, ask myself perhaps if there is uh, uh, anything like Czech Euroscepticism, or can Czechs be considered a nation of Euroskeptics? I have certain doubts about it uh, because uh, under previous president uh, Václav Havel, there was definitely anything sticking out in Europe uh, uh, that uh, Czechs could uh, look like uh, some kind of harsh Eurosceptics or anything. Czechs are skeptics by nature, I would say. They are uh, constantly complaining. They are a nation of, uh, sometimes can be very cynical, pragmatic. It helps them to survive, but uh, they are constantly complaining, mumbling against uh, everything. It doesn't mean that they are, they are very depressive uh, nations. There can be a lot of fun with us, which is uh, an advantage. But uh, I don't think that... Uh, so overall, there is nothing like deeply rooted Czech Euroscepticism, I would say. O obviously, it's my opinion. Someone else could disagree. Uh, I would also differentiate, certainly, between Euroscepticism, which is a sort of obsessive mm -hmm. ideology, and dogmatism and between some cautiousness towards what is currently happening happening with the management of the Eurozone as such. Because if we look about the management of the Euro crisis, I think no one can be surprised that our country is not hurrying into the Eurozone at this very moment. And even though I am myself a big supporter of the Euro still, and uh, I consider myself Euro-Federalist, I find it hard sometimes to defend all these uh, decisions which are by being accepted on the, on the level of the Eurozone or, or European Union because all these proposals are being changed every few weeks and new institutions created and their, their powers are... So if from outside it really looks like a mismanagement, I also believe that it is a mismanagement. But unlike Mr. Klaus, I very much hope that that it's gonna come uh, to a positive solution. So uh, I, I believe that uh, the main root of Czech Euroscepticism, this ideological Euroscepticism, is actually our uh, president, Václav Klaus, uh, who is, uh, uh, even though we, uh, uh, Czech Republic is a parliamentary democracy and not a presidential system, so it's not even close to a uh, semi-presidential system like uh, France or Poland. Uh, so our president also is not only a ceremonial function, as many people uh, falsely think. So he's not only spreading opinions. He is very powerful. He is, for instance, uh, naming uh, all the justices of the Constitutional Court, even though he, he has checks and balances with the Senate. But he is also naming all the board of uh, Central Bank without any checks and balances is his uh, sole solution. And if you can imagine that these days, after eight years of being a president, the board of the Central Bank, which is very influential in our country, 
are all loyalists uh, to Klaus's opinions on the European Union and Euro. And uh, they are, publicly speaking, they are writing articles to, news, to the newspapers. And uh, if there is any tendency in our nations, people, there is perhaps some uh, careeristic loyalty to powerful people because it can bring you a lot of advantages. So president has a lot of uh, power in foreign policy, uh, in the judicial system, because he's not only naming all the, all the justices of the Constitutional Court, but all the judges in a, uh, in a, in a system as such. So uh, people, Czechs definitely know how to be loyal and take advantages of their loyal positions. Also, Klaus's, uh, Mr. Klaus's uh, policy often is that he is rewarding those people who are uh, loyal to him, so uh, since people know it, so it's we cannot be surprised that his uh, position is getting more strength. Another uh, problem recently is that uh, main right-wing uh, party ODS, uh, which is the leading party in the government coalition, also uh, changed its uh, chairman recently and current chairman and, and uh, prime minister is uh, much more friendly and loyal to uh, to Václav Klaus and his ideology, especially because he doesn't have any strong opinion himself. Uh, people who are leading ODS feel that they are perhaps not educated enough to compete with Klaus because he is this smart economist. So it's another problem that he is sort of president, even though he is a president and we also have a prime minister, he's sort of taking over ideological leadership in the foreign policy of <coughs> our country. So uh, what is very typical for Mr. Klaus, because he is a smart and good politician, so any space which is being provided to him, he Im immediately explores and fulfills this uh, space very smartly and actively. And I cannot complain about this, because other politicians have a chance to do the same thing. They just don't do it. Uh, also, in the media, uh, it, I, I'm not going to go to the media, but media, most of the printed media don't have enough uh, educated journalists who would like to go into a polemic with Mr. Klaus, so this sort of skeptical attitude is kind of prevailing. I should also emphasize some kind of uh, sort of generational thing, because... Uh, our country is being governed by people who are around 50 these days. At, uh, when they were trying to get educated, like economists in 1980s, in some sort of shadow seminars uh, about political economy, organized, by the way, also to an extent by Mr. Klaus. At that time, it was fashionable to be a follower of Mr. Friedman, etc. As it is typical for the economists and for the politicians, they just don't get educated constantly and change uh, perhaps their opinions they 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 just and they don't read books and they don't read any in, 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 in general so they just they just remember what they were following when they were young so uh, <laughs> so still you would be surprised and in, a, in our country like mainstream sort of uh, opinion of economists in, is, is this sort of like Friedmanite libertarian uh, approach, which also quite dominates at Prague School of Economics, where Mr. Klaus is also a professor. So not only that we have a center bank and we have a lot of powers of the president, he also has dozens of followers at Prague School of Economics who are still uh, spreading this sort of libertarian religion, which is sort of like Jehovah Witnesses, it seems to me. So. So now to, I should also mention that uh, what is, uh, has been very disappointing for me that I have been myself writing many times to propose let's discuss it in our public debate seriously. I haven't witnessed any serious discussion about definition of Czech national interests. <coughs> Even though politicians uh, like to use the term national interest, there is no deep discussion about Czech national interests. So I don't understand what is the pillar or a cornerstone of Czech foreign policy. If we come to Brussels and have opinions on everything, no normal public doesn't know uh, what 
where are these opinions coming from? Because national interests are not defined. There is certainly a lack of co cooperation across the political spectrum to define the principles of uh, our foreign policy. So if we are so unable to start such a d discussion or deliberation on foreign policy, we cannot be surprised that uh, it's being kidnapped by uh, by activists who have a strong opinion, even though they don't discuss it with the public. So it's our big, big weakness, uh, lack of definition of uh, national interest. Uh, so here I was speaking about, uh, I should also say that for many people in the population, Klaus is still considered a sort of father of market reform. So as Mr. Havel was considered like someone who brought help to br bring freedom to our country. Mr. Klaus is someone who brought a free market to our country. So for many people in, in our country, he is still a sort of father of free market. Uh, so, so people, still you have a lot of people who take him very seriously. So uh, now I should speak a little bit about this because it's something different. And I think I sh we should, uh, even though it's connected, it. I believe that it's different. So I should also mention the topic of this cautiousness towards uh, Euro and, uh, and uh, Eurozone. <clears throat> uh, there are perhaps some legitimate uh, historical reasons because uh, Czech crown, uh, in, even between the wars in 1920s and 30s, uh, avoided any kind of hyperinflation which was occurring, occurring in neighboring countries, Austria, Germany. There was a tradition of quite, uh, not independent central bank at the time, but certainly an in prestigious central bank with a strong opinion. Uh, so uh, Czech crown in between the wars was a stable currency. Even the, under the communists, in comparison with Hungary and their sort of goulash socialism, Czech communism, Czech communists surprisingly didn't indebt it, uh, didn't indebt the country abroad. So the level of the debt, national debt, was very low. Level of, of the external debt was almost uh, zero. So there was some, even under the communism and under the, like a Soviet satellite, there was some consciousness as far as the fiscal and monetary affairs are concerned. So there is definitely some tradition. And even though we cannot compare it to uh, German love affair with uh, D Mark, it's Czechs definitely don't have negative attitude towards uh, their own currency because they can have quite a uh, good uh, memory of it. Uh, very important moment is that our country avoided financial crisis. Uh, and uh, it didn't avoid economic crisis, which was the second stage of the, of the global crisis. But there was no banking crisis. It, uh, it's not because we were so smart, but uh, our banking sector is fully uh, owned uh, by uh, foreign uh, banks, which probably didn't permit their Czech daughters to speculate with some uh, strange cosmic uh, uh, financial products because if they would speculate with them, they would do it in, in their headquarters in Vienna or Paris or somewhere else. It, we also had a do, good luck with privatization of our banking sector because we for, fortunately didn't privatize our bank, major, major important banks to some German Landesbanks, which was possible, or, or British banks. Or, so uh, there was a coincidence in the choice of, uh, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't a smart uh, move, but coincidentally, uh, our banks were privatized to, to banks which, which were not absolutely destroyed by the, by the financial crisis. It could have been different, coincidence, coincidentally. So uh, people see that uh, and saw the banking crisis in Europe, in Eurozone, and they think our banks are doing better, so they, therefore we should be careful and not to hurry up uh, anywhere. Uh, so not only, uh, even though uh, 
Czech economy is functioning into an extent like another Bundes uh, Republic, but there is very much interconnectedness with the Czech economy and German economy. So even though we were not touched by the financial crisis, we were certainly heavily impacted by the economic crisis. So the drop uh, in 2008-2009, mm -hmm. there was a drop of in, in industrial and production basically comparable to, to, to German fall of industrial production. So it was really like uh, for a while, uh, like 30-40% drop of uh, industrial production. But even in such a situation, uh, uh, for 2009, uh, our finance minister projected the economic growth 4.8%, but it was exactly the opposite, just the minus for 2009. But even in such a situation, miraculously, Czech banking sector remained profitable. So people feel that it's managed properly and supervised properly, supervised properly by the central bank, which is uh, doing uh, its job professionally. Uh, so even though I was criticizing uh, central bank people for being loyalists and eurosceptics, as far as the banking supervision, they are uh, quite uh, professional, I believe. So, uh, also, financial crisis came in a very good time for Czechs because this boom in mortgages and real estate just sort of started and uh, it was artificially interrupted by the financial crisis because since uh, mothers uh, of our banks suffered from the financial crisis, they they dictated to our banks much uh, much uh, more conservative approach to the real estate sector and to mortgages very suddenly even though our economic cycles as as far as the real estate are concerned was like sort of out of touch with the with the stream in the in the western world in this respect so it came in a good time because we slowed down the tempo of of our banks slow down the tempo of uh, mortgages and sort of stop the bubble before it was uh, before it was born. Also, it doesn't have to do with checks uh, being so smart. It has to do with the fact that we had a banking crisis in 1990s. It was a prolonged banking crisis. Uh, first, we started at the beginning of 90s with with all these new small banks emerge and then big banks were semi-privatized only and <coughs> and it led to the situation that paradoxically uh, by the socialist government between 98 and 2002 all the banks were privatized even though under Mr. Klaus when he was a prime minister he was he didn't have the courage to to privatize uh, the the bank so all these banks were sold for basically one crown and uh, to experienced uh, uh, foreign owners, which is also a good, uh, perhaps it's a moment which would be worthwhile to discuss here into what extent there was a chance for Ireland two, three years ago to do something else, to get rid of its own uh, banking sector, because I believe it's uh, functioning to our politics quite well, because uh, ten years ago, you could constantly hear about the banks being somehow interconnected into politics and having friendly relationships with political parties. These days, you don't hear about banks uh, because the main decisions are probably taken abroad anyway. So, unlike uh, Chess, which is our energy monopoly or dominant player on the energy market, you constantly hear all the news or how chess is connected with political parties and with politicians, so you don't hear about the banks in this respect. So even though we gave up the idea of having national banking, which obviously everything has its pros and cons and assets and liabilities, so there are definitely liabilities, but as far as political culture is concerned, it's definitely positive. So you don't hear about politicians meddling into the into the banking system anymore so a few more things about uh, about Czech uh, euroscepticism here uh, I should also mention that with the with the crisis of the media there is a lack of attention to what is being happening in Brussels but we are not unique in this respect mm -hmm. if you look at the number of correspondents in in Brussels, it just uh, uh, goes down across Europe. 
so people don't get enough picture of what is happening there. But definitely, it seems to me very interesting that uh, Czech Eurosceptics quite successfully uh, are putting equation in between European Union and Brussels. So, it, which is interesting to me because for me European Union is everything, all this space and uh, life and culture, everything which is happening within borders of European Union. Whereas for the Eurosceptics, European Union equals Brussels. So it's one of the, my favorite argument that we shouldn't mistake Brussels for the European Union. Brussels, the European Union is something completely different. But they are quite skilled in convincing a lot of people that European Union is Brussels and bureaucracy and everything, even though this bureaucracy is quite limited. There is also a tendency in Czech politics that uh, if there is anything pleasant happening, it's due to them. If there is anything unpleasant happening, it's due to European Union. So this is, but I wonder, it's probably not very unique for a Czech Republic, it's uh, everywhere. I should also mention, and it uh, paradoxically also has to do with Mr. Klaus, we had a very unpleasant uh, solar boom, uh, which was, uh, which threatened actually to uh, damage or cripple competitiveness of our industry due to subsidized prices <coughs> and due to the inability of the government to react in time. Prices of electric energy due to this artificial <coughs> solar boom could jump 26% in January. It was stopped at last moment. But once again, it helps Mr. Klaus because Mr. <coughs> Klaus was always critical to these like artificial, you know, ecologist project. So not only as far as the euro is concerned, people feel that Mr. Klaus was right. It also sort of uh, underlines his, uh, po uh, strengthened his position because he was also saying, look, these artificial green things like a support of the solar energy in a country which uh, has doesn't have enough uh, sunshine. So people see, okay, maybe Mr. Klaus is quite right in his uh, predictions. So this is, uh, uh, did I, sp how, how much? Uh, a couple have? more minutes. A few more minutes, yeah. okay. So I, I was saying that I would like to introduce sort of my, uh, briefly my idea of uh, Eurofederalism. I actually believe that the uh, current crisis of the Euro is not a crisis of the, uh, of the debt. It's a crisis, it's an institutional crisis and uh, I believe that the uh, European Central Bank is a sole federal institution uh, because federalism is not, be it's not centralism. First in Europe we should agree with federalism, but federalism is certainly not centralism. So uh, uh, federalism is very much based on inner competition and checks and balances and Central Bank is providing these checks and balances in to an extent the, the, the way ECB is constituted. So you know that in the US you have uh, two senators for Montana and California. In European Central Bank there is much stronger position of Luxembourg uh, than uh, it otherwise uh, should be. So it's, it's, it's an only federal institution. So European Union is standing by one leg in uh, federation, but uh, Two other legs, which is uh, uh, common European bond and common treasury, are lacking. So you have this table standing on on uh, one uh, one uh, pillar only, and uh, or leg. And uh, so it's natural that such a system cannot ever be stable. I think that uh, if you make this first step into the federation, you have to finish the step. But it's it. It will be a process, obviously, even in the US it was a process. But I believe that the only way for the solution of the crisis would be to come gradually to a process of, uh, to have a, a common European bond. Uh, I very much support the proposal which was done by Tremont and Juncker in December. They wrote an article in Financial Times for Common European Bond. And I believe that uh, ESM sooner or later will become some kind of a European monetary fund and then it will transform itself into a kind of treasury. So if you look at the overall level of debt in Europe, it's uh, certainly 120% lower than in Japan. 
it's much lower than in the U.S. So it's not a it's not a crisis of the debt. It's an institutional crisis mm -hmm. of the euro, and and uh, so in its fundament, it is a political crisis, I believe. So that's far like a naive uh, idealist. I believe that uh, we shouldn't speak also about the euro. We should also speak about how to create a political federation. So I, I actually believe that we should start with an upper chamber of European Parliament, with every country having two senators. And uh, uh, so this is sort of my naive goal, but uh, perhaps we can discuss it later. Okay, so thanks for the attention. Thank